Now, most of you have uh, been to the first session or watched the DVDs, yes? And have all of you had the uh, opportunity to ask the questions you wanted to ask? No. No? <laughs> no. No. So, do, do you want to just start with a few minutes of answering some questions? Would you yes. do that? And then we can get on to the topic for today. How's that sound? So, those of you who wanted to ask a question, go ahead. I just wanted to know, you talked about connecting with God um, emotionally. Yep. That's the only way that you can connect with God. And I just want you to talk more about the emotions. And you also said that um, you know it's truth because um, of your emotions. And I just wanted you to talk a bit more about that. Okay. Um, so the connection with God is a soul-to-soul -soul connection. And I suppose a lot of what we'll be answering today, that question a lot, because today our discussion is about the human soul. What is your, your soul? And it's important to understand that every, every connection that you have with God and with other people here, all the people here too you have a connection with, but it's all not an intellectual connection. It's all actually a feeling-based or emotionally-based connection. It's a soul-to-soul -soul connection. And when you start understanding that everything that's happening in your life is actually based around what's going on inside of your soul, then you start seeing the importance of this understanding the soul itself and what the soul is all about. So a lot of your question will be answered today by going through this subject about the human soul and what it is. And, and the truth? Like, because I, I always, what I know to be, what I would say is divine truth, comes from within and there's this knowing there's this trust and is that what you're talking about? Um, not completely because the, the problem with our emotional state is that we are all beginning with all of these emotional injuries that's been impressed upon us through our parents injuries and our environment injuries and so forth. So as that gets impressed upon us many of the things that we feel are truthful and therefore feel emotionally connected with are actually from God's perspective error. So, so we can't always trust what's going on inside of us emotionally if we're looking at God's truth. But there is a connection we can trust. And that's the connection that's the resonance between our soul and God's soul. So once, when we're receiving divine love, then we can trust what's coming to us with regard to truth. How do we know that? Uh, because the reception of divine love is an actual emotion that you're receiving from God. And when you receive it, you know you're receiving it in that particular moment. All right? And you know that it's from outside of yourself, not inside of yourself. All right? Remember in the beginning I said there was two loves. There's the natural love and then there's the divine love. And remember I said the natural love is the love that you have in, built inside of you that you can expand and grow. That's the love that you express for everyone else. Then there's the divine love and that love is God's love. God's love can also enter you and expand your soul as well and you can then reflect that love through your own love to others as well but you must first receive divine love and you can't receive divine love from anyone other than God so that's an important thing to bear in mind so the love that you feel and express from within yourself is the natural love growing within you and that's a part of your growth every one of us needs to grow in the way we reflect natural love so, you know, when you feel like compassion for somebody because of their circumstance or situation and you want to help them, well, that's your natural love being expressed <coughs> to that person. Right? Now, that natural love that you're expressing to the other person can grow and change in its qualities and attributes to a new type of love when God's love enters you. So when God's love enters you, it changes your soul so much that the type of love you reflect to other people also changes. So it's important to understand, though, that it's the connection with the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of truth. So it's the connection between you and God at a soul level that actually lets the emotion flow through you, where you are actually connected with God. Under those circumstances, you know what truth is. Anything that creates you pain and anything that you often feel is actually pleasurable is often based on needy emotions being projected to to others and, and you want a response from them. So, for example, um, a lot of people today believe it's loving to be very influential in their own children's lives. 
Right? How many of you are always concerned about what's happening with your children? How many mothers are always concerned about what's happening with your children? Quite a few, right? Now, that is not a ref that is actually an error-based emotion, believe it or not. Now, every mother who hears those words usually reacts, "No, it's not. It's, this is this is what I'm meant to have within me." But every emotion inside of you that creates a worry is not love. Love never worries. Right? Do you think God worries? Does God worry? Obviously not. And he's always reflecting love, right? So, so when you get in a state of abundance with God, do you think you're going to worry? Even about your children? Even if your children even die, do you think you're going to worry? Right? You're not. Because you'll know the full truth and there won't be any emotional signature with any of those events, right? So oftentimes what we're doing with our emotions is we're holding on to negative emotions and we base our actions upon those emotions that we think are truthful. And this is the problem with all natural love progression. All of us at, at the moment here believe things that are not true, but we, with our whole heart, believe them to be true. And so when you say trusting yourself, the problem with trusting yourself is there's going to be some emotions within you that actually you can't really trust if you want to be at one with God. Right? Now you will need to experience them, but you're not, you, if you trust them in the sense of you believe them to be true, then that will stop your progression towards God. Does that make sense? And now at the start it's very difficult <coughs> to determine what is God's truth, what is my truth, what do I hold on, what do I reject? The key thing is if you go into it emotionally every time, you won't need to worry about that. Because what happens is when you go into it emotionally is if there's any emotions bubbling up inside of you that are painful, then they are emotions that just need to come out. And all of them are not based upon love. So how many of you feel you've been hurt by loving somebody? Right? Now that feeling is actually an error feeling. When I say it's an error of feeling, what it, what it is, is if you feel love hurts, then it wasn't love that you had. It was something else. You follow me? Because God never hurts. Like God, even if you decide you never even want to connect with God ever in your entire life, you never want to experience God, you're going to deny God's existence even. God does not feel hurt with you doing that. The reason why is because God gave you the gift of free will and you can do whatever you like. Why would he be hurt about a gift that he's given you? Right. Now, if I'm feeling hurt about my expression of love to someone else, then there is something inside of that hurt that wasn't love in the first place. And I need to allow myself to experience that. So can you see how a lot of times we hold on to things inside of ourselves that we believe to be true, but in reality... And most of the time, in many cases, they are actually in disharmony with God's love. And it's a matter of releasing them. So I, I never believed that I'd get into a state myself where I could say, watch my soulmate do something, like even have a relationship with someone else and still love her without feeling hurt. You follow me? And even if she left me to have a relationship with somebody else, I'd never felt that I could actually you know, be comfortable with that. But now I feel that I'm, I'm totally comfortable with that. Right? There'd be no hurt associated. Now, it took nine weeks of crying for five hours a day to get into that state. Right? To release all of the emotional pain that was connecting me to those, other, those old emotions. You follow me? But once you release all of those emotions, then you get into a state where that no longer you don't feel a connection with that anymore. And that will happen all the way through your progression. So all of those ladies that put up their hand about worrying about their children, you'll get to a state in your own progression where you no longer worry about your children. All you do is love them. Right? And you won't feel like you have to interfere with their life and you won't feel like you have to guide them and you won't talk about them when they're doing something you think is wrong or you think is hurting them. or You, you won't feel all of those emotions anymore. You will just want to give them love when they want to receive that love. So you follow how things can be, like we believe them to be true, but in reality a lot of times 
from God's perspective, they're actually error. And it's only when you release the emotional error that you can recognize more truth. And a lot of people then ask, well, how do I know that I'm realizing an emo that I'm re releasing emotional error? If it's painful, you're releasing emotional error. Right? If it's joyous, you're accepting an emotional truth. So how many of you have had a moments of epiphany when it's just all just joyous that you've received? Sometimes I've heard, felt it in the groups, hey? quite a lot of you. Those moments are when your soul just expanded because you received the truth. And, and you might even be crying at the time, but you'd be crying tears of joy, right? Now that's a totally different experience than releasing the emotional error. The emotional error is often a very painful experience. It's like you've had these barbs sticking in you emotionally and you've just yanked one out. And all of a sudden, you know, there's just huge pain associated with that. Well, it's okay. You can, receive, you can go through all of that pain and you will need to eventually go through and pull out all of those barbs that have been stuck in you from the moment you incarnated onwards and eventually you'll be free of them. Right? Now that's the only time, once you're completely free of them, that you'll always be in the state where you're re receiving truth if you decide to connect to God. But there are people here on earth and in the spirit world who believe themselves to be connecting to God but it's only an intellectual exercise and they are not connecting with God but they believe themselves to be connecting with God and they're in a very good condition of happiness. They've released lots of their emotions. Am I received an email? Is Tim here today? How are you, Tim? Good. Nice to meet you. Tim uh, mentioned an email to me recently about how you were going through this experience of you know, doing emotional clearing work yeah. and, and you found it very, very effective. Yeah. And, and then you realised that, the, that, that the, the ingredient missing was God. Yeah, and, and this is, so all of you will need to do emotional clearing work, whether you decide to go on the natural love path and develop yourself in natural love, or go on the divine path and develop yourself in divine love. You will all have to do emotional clearing work. But the difference is this connection with God that matters. And we'll talk more about that today because of the soul and how that connection actually occurs. All right. Now there's another question. Yeah, um, this is about... Um, those little beautiful circles that you draw with the male and the female, and you do that a lot. And this um, one here, like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, then we all have our male and our female side. So. Um, oh, careful, careful. We're not drawing that. I'm actually drawing. It, it, it's a yin and yang symbol, right? Mm -hmm. And actually, remember that it splits in half. And we'll talk more about this today. So remember that. The masculine half splits off and the feminine half splits off at incarnation, but each person does have masculine and feminine qualities, of course. So that's why there's a little dot in each half, just to indicate that there's a part of the other in each as well. There's a part of the feminine in the masculine, and there's a part of the masculine in the feminine. Okay. But go on with your question, sorry. And, and, and then you did um, put up the uh, distribution curve, and you were saying that we're sort of randomly dispersed around that curve. Yeah, in terms like of male side and then female side. Right? In terms of the creation of the complete soul, this oh, thing, that, not oh, these. Oh, okay. You follow me? Oh, right. So okay. there are, the complete soul also has a dominant characteristics in sexuality, what we would call sexuality. So it can be dominantly masculine or dominantly feminine or more sort of evenly distributed. Mm -hmm. Right. The one, those that are dominantly masculine will split into two masculine. In entities in the connection. But they still have female side in them. It, exactly. There's still female qualities in them. Good. Yeah. Okay. So like in a gay male couple, for example, a gay soulmate couple, uh -huh. um, the Apostle John is an example of that. He, he, him and his soulmate are gay, a couple, from our perspective here on earth. And um, when, when they separated and incarnated, they incarnated into two male, uh, each a male form. Mm -hmm. John's side of the male form was heavily masculine mm -hmm. and his, his um, opposite half, if you like, his soulmate was was a little more feminine than he. Okay. Mm. All right. And that balances. Is that supposed to balance it out? Um, yeah. The way I see it is that each soul is an individual within itself. So each soul has individual characteristics and and specific attributes <coughs> that no other person, no other soul, no other complete soul in the universe has. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about balance. What do we define as balance in the end? 
right? Really what we're talking about is each soul has its unique, its unique individualization. And, and within itself, the split of that soul is just totally determined by how God created that. And so, like this talk about balance, like being balanced here and balanced there, to me it's sort of more of an intellectual discussion then, rather than, mm -hmm. rather than an emotional discussion. Mm -hmm. When you connect with yourself fully emotionally, you're not worried about balance or, in fact, you don't worry about hardly anything <laughs> at all. <laughs> right? And you don't worry, of course, once you're a one with God, you don't worry about anything at all. So you're not even concerned about, am I being balanced right now or am I not being balanced right now? That never even enters your mind. Okay. Yeah. So um, when when we become come in as a female body or a male body, that really is irrelevant. And the soul will all, the full soul will always split in the same manner. So so my half of the soul in the first century was masculine. My soulmate's half was feminine, right? Uh -huh. When we split this time, my soulmate's my soul is <coughs> my half the soul's masculine. Like so, each time you go into a similar a similar body, in other words, a similar gendered body. So you don't swap genders. Now, many of you have been taught through New Age stuff that you were a female or a male in the past, right? Many of you have heard that? What's actually happening is you have heavy spirit influence with spirits who are with you, giving you their life experience. Right? They're, they're trying to work through their emotional issues with you. They feel attracted to you. And they try to work through their emotional issues with you by doing that. And it triggers emotions inside of you. All right? So many of you have guides with you right now who are the opposite gender to yourself. And the reason why is there's a certain aspect within yourself they feel you need to develop that you're not developing. You follow me? And so they stay with you until they work through those particular issues. Do you mind if I mention no. yourself, Grant? Like, you, ten years ago, from Grant's perspective, you were sort of dominantly masculine, not understanding the feminine so well. That would be a fairly accurate statement, would it? Yes. Yeah. And then what's ha been happening over the last 10 years for Grant is he's been having more and more relationships with women that are friendship-based relationships. And he's learning a lot about women in that, in that way, right? Learning a lot about coming to love women, not from a sexual perspective, but rather from a more complete friendship perspective, right? And in the process of doing that, what you've been doing is just like growing in the way that you understand femininity. Right? And so that, that's what happens a lot, is that we often also have spirits around us who are also trying to assist us to do that same thing. Right? And some of those spirits will be in a sad place still, and they will need your assistance to help them to do those things. And others will be in quite a good place and they're just giving you pictures about their life to trigger your emotion to actually help you experience some of your emotion. Tim? Um, in the first century, how did you, I mean, you were pretty much by yourself, how did you actually get yourself to a level where you were able to understand that you were communicating with God? Um, it began when I was very, very little. Um, you know how nowadays a lot of you have, have had, probably in your own life, like, spirit friends that you've talked to from a young age and you call them, your, your parents finished up calling them your imaginary friends or whatever and maybe made a lot of um, you know, jokes about that or whatever. What happened for myself was that that began at a very young age where I just felt the connection with God and I didn't understand it at the beginning but then I started realising that I was connecting to the person who had created everything around me. Like, so everything that I saw and everything that I felt, there was a confirming emotion that I felt coming from God. And as I grew up, um, I became more and more aware uh, through my study of what you would call nowadays the prophets in the Bible, and I studied all of those in the first century, I became more and more and more aware of what they were talking about in terms of having a one with God, in terms of having a new heart, a heart of flesh rather than a heart of stone, and what they called the transformation that they all, many of the prophets had experienced from spirits. And I started incorporating all of those things in my life, connecting with the source of all things rather than to the spirits, as prophets would do or as mediums would do. And as, I, as that grew, my desire for God's love grew to such an extent that when I was in my teens, I started realising that I had this unique connection with God that people around me didn't seem to have. And... Uh, and then through my study of the, 
of the prophets again, I started looking, at, I wanted to find the Messiah um, because, you know, it was foretold in my, that in my generation the Messiah would appear and it was a well-known thing uh, back in Israel at that time. And so I was really, really interested in this idea of um, the Messiah appearing. I wanted to find him and learn things from him and all those kind of things. So I went through these emotions in my late teens of, you know, looking what qualities and attributes the Messiah would have and so forth. And it was only um, in my early 20s that I started realising that those qualities and attributes were, were qualities and attributes within myself. And, and so then I had to go through this process of recognising um, this unique place that I seemed to be in, that I thought initially that everyone else must be in as well. But you know how it's like when you're a child, you think that everyone else feels exactly the same as you do. And then as you grow up into an adult and you grow further and further, you start realising, hang a sec, no, they don't feel the way I do. And it was only then that I started seeing how, how different what was going on inside of me was to the people around me. So it was sort of like a gradual progression of this divine love flowing into my soul, which I could feel, and my longing then for it growing and growing and growing to such a point that uh, when I was in my late 20s, uh, um, I felt the connection complete. So I became at one with God. And that's when I began telling others about it in a public way. Is that answer? Yeah. yeah. So is it similar when you were talking to that then, like similar to the sort of things you're telling us? In terms of emotions, yeah. It, what, um, it was a little different for me back then in that um, there. I didn't have too many errors to actually work my way through because this connection began at such a young age. And so a lot of the things that would happen around me and my family didn't enter me emotionally. You know, so my father treated me a certain way under certain conditions. My father felt he was cursed to have me as his child. But that feeling didn't enter me uh, because I'd already by that stage know that I wasn't cursed and he wasn't either. Um, so there was just that feeling within me that that wasn't the truth. So, you know how most of us have taken on truth from our parents, right? What we call truth, which is really error. But we're taking on these conceptions, right? From our parents, and, and they've been absorbed into us. Well, that didn't happen to me very much in the first century at all. And so what, what that meant was that I could clearly see what was going on, and I wasn't personally hurt or offended by what was going on around me because of that. Yeah. Um, when you were Jesus, I lost a lot of it. Um, you, used, you used to do a lot of healings in those days. Yeah. Um, by the way, I have CFS. Yeah. That's, that's not part of the question. There was a projection um, there that I would have to do with that. <laughs> um, and you did your healings in those days. Do you find you have, to, if, if someone gets a healing, that it's basically healing the cause to the problem and then the physical um, um, hang, hang, hang on to that, which is the biological problem, yeah. the physical problem, yeah. um, it goes away because there's a reconciliation between that person spiritually. Yeah, um, yeah, it's important to understand what's happening with healing. And in the first century, once I became at one with God, and the same will happen to all of you once you get into that state of at one with God, you'll feel it very, very easy to heal other people. But you'll also have some very <laughs> strong divine love constraints, if you like, against uh, upon that. When I say divine love constraints, there are certain laws involved with divine love, and we'll talk about some of them today, that actually limit what you may do because of free will. So if a person is holding on to an emotion within them, and then they come and they say, I want to be healed, but they're not willing to actually address the emotional cause within them, healing them is actually a totally pointless exercise. Because what happens is if you heal them, they would just recreate the illness again through their emotional condition. So it's very important, and this also applies to spirit possession and other issues too, it's very important that people understand the causes of what's actually going on in each interaction, and that's very much the case with healing. If people don't understand the emotional causes and are willing to address the emotional causes, then what's the point of addressing the effect? One thing to bear in mind, and there's a whole discussion I have for a half a day on cause and effect, one of the laws of God. And one thing to understand that's very basic about God is God never fixes something at its effect level. He only addresses things at the causal level. 
Mm. You understand the difference? Like, you look at all a man's laws. We have, like, hundreds of thousands of... Most of you have got no idea what laws you are now living under. Isn't that the case? How many... You have to go to a lawyer to find out what laws you're living under, right? And even he doesn't know, right? He has to get out the whole taxation volume thing and and slap that on the table and he has to get out all these other laws and, and, you know, that's why they study for so many years to get to that condition where they even know how to find the law. And yet, we're automatically so-called living under this law, right? Now, all of these laws, the majority of them deal with effects. So, the law of you have to drive on one side of the road deals with an effect of people not being consider it normally, so you make a law so that everyone knows the same, to do the same thing. And it just makes everything more orderly and harmonious. And you can look at a lot of laws, like the law about speeding is one of those laws. Like, you're driving along, there's no one on the road, and there's an 80k sign. How do you feel? <laughs> like, you're driving along at 3 in the morning, and there's just no one there, just you, right? And, and there's an 80k sign comes up after 110, and you're looking around going, why am I doing this right? <laughs> but if there's like the whole place is packed with traffic, an 80k sign might be far too fast, right? You might need to slow right down to 60 or even less. Because it's not actually addressing the cause of the problem. All of these signs and all of these laws. God only addresses causes. Right? So it's very important to understand that is also a principle with healing. God will only address the cause. So God's divine love will not enter a person to address a, an effect of a thing that's inside of them that has a cause if they are unwilling to deal with the emotion. Just to continue on that, if, if people practice healing, you're probably better off just working with the emotions primarily and then the second, secondary would be the physical response to that. Exactly. You know all the spirit body work that you can do, like, you know, you can do a lot of spiritual healing work with chakras and so forth and get all of the energy points in a person, physical, uh, person's spirit body working properly. All of that work is pointless if you can't understand that it's the soul, which is what we're going to talk about today, that's driving all of those injuries. So this is why you can go back to a spiritual healing session, feel good for a day, and then the emotions start, you know, of course the emotions are just going to reimpose their same errors upon the, the being. And so, what's the point in solving the physical problem when the emotion that created the physical problem still exists within the person? All you're going to be doing is making them reliant on you. Now, God doesn't do that, but there are lots and lots of six fear spirits and spirits on the natural love path who will do that constantly. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of healers nowadays who are healing people fairly well, but they get the injuries again back later. And the reason why is because there's a lot of natural love spirits who are healing the person for whatever reasons the natural love spirits have to do it, but not respecting this law of cause and effect in, in, that's happening upon the soul. You mean all pervasive, you mean you're talking about God? Yeah. How can you be separate from God? And then I wanted to know how to have a personal, more intimate um, relationship with God. That, yeah. that I was in person. Alright. The gift of free will is what enables you to decide whatever you want. So that gift that God gave you can be exercised in such a way that you then believe you are not connected with God. Right? So you create separateness. Right? And it's very important to understand that in the beginning, God created us to be at one with God eventually. But God didn't automatically give that gift to you because then she would have been overcoming your free will. She wants you to make a free will choice to connect with her. You follow me? She doesn't want, you to, for she doesn't want to force herself or force her love on you. Is it love then? No. No. So God does not force her love on you. So there is no divine love in you at the time you incarnate. <coughs> so please understand that. There's a common fallacy today that, we, that people believe we all have the divine spark within us. That's one of the things I address today. You have a natural love spark within you. And if you want to receive a divine love in you, you need to ask for it. It's quite simple. 
And there's one, the one reason why is because God's love is, belongs to God, something outside of you, and it can enter you only if your free will is exercised. God always respects your free will. So that's the first thing to understand. Separateness is created by our desire to disconnect. Firstly, from ourselves, but also, in the end, from things around us. So as soon as you desire to disconnect from your emotion, you're at that moment desiring to disconnect from yourself, because your true self is your emotion, and you're desiring to disconnect from everyone around you, and you're desiring to connect, disconnect from God. As soon as you reconnect with your emotion, whatever that emotion is, and it could be that you're fume and angry, as soon as you start connecting to that emotion, you're now at least connecting with yourself. You might not be connecting with too other, many other people in that state, but at least with yourself, you're at least making the first step into this process of connecting with yourself, everyone, and, and God as well. Does that make sense? And the second half of your question was? To have a personal love at one point. We'll talk about that more today, because that's part of the soul discussion I want to go through today. Hey, Jay, I just got a two-part question. Um, I've just been wondering lately, which one came first, the thought or the emotion? The emotion always. So, so the first people to incarnate, they would have received an emotion first? And then their mind would have categorised it? Um, if you think about a child, it very rarely has thoughts associated with emotions. It's only as we grow that we start making thoughts associated with emotions generally. So the very first thing that kicks you off with everything is your emotion, or your passion, or your desire. So when I talk about emotion, I'm using a term very generally, because I might also be, mean passion, desire, longing, and all those other things. So, for example, if I have a longing for your love, but you don't give it to me, then I'll feel a feeling within me that I'm not receiving it. And that will create a thought within me that may be through a filter of why. Like, I may blame myself and say I'm not up to your standard and that's why I'm not getting your love. Or if I don't have that feeling, it might, you know, it might, there might be other feelings in me that create these thoughts. But the trouble with most of us is that they create the thoughts so rapidly, these emotions, that we think that it's the thoughts that are controlling us. And we think that if we think new things, that it's going to help. Now, every spirit on the natural love path thinks that. They think that if you create new thoughts in your mind, it will change your emotions. But you know what's actually happening is you're creating a fictitious state. You're not being real. It's only the release of the emotion that creates bliss in the end. And the release of the emotions about experience. So how, how do you, because I, I actually get them mixed up, I think. Well, you're very thought-oriented and have been from, from childhood. It's been browbeaten into you to, to think rather than feel. Yeah. And because of, that, because of that, there's this constant desire to get back into the intellect all the time, right? And that's, many of you have the same thing going on, right? This constant trigger to get back into the intellect. And it's very much more dominant in a male than a female, generally, as well. And so, so what we're trying to do all the time is explain the universe around us through our thoughts. But the only time we're going to understand the universe around us is through our feelings. And again, a lot of those questions will be answered today in this session that we talked about. Because they seem to um, let you feel, you feel the emotion, then the mind will just pop up straight away. And a lot of times the mind pops up with a different <coughs> thought, even compared to the emotion sometimes, doesn't it? Have you noticed that? Does your mind have to be still to release an emotion? Um, your mind has to be the passive, the passive observer of your emotion. Or you could even make it into the active observer by helping you access the, the soul's emotion. When, when your mind is the, domi is the dominant part of you being, that's the thing that you need to undo. Because if your mind's dominant, what happens is your mind is constantly trying to suppress what the emotional expression is. And so all of you have been taught at some point in your childhood to dominate your emotion with your mind. Like, how many times have you heard it? Emotion is weak. Like, it's a common belief, isn't it? Even in New Age belief, it's a common belief, isn't it? Your, your, your emotion is weak, your mind is strong. Use your mind to dominate your emotion. It's a common, common teachings all the way through life. How, ma how many times do you see parents shutting down their emotions? So, each one of you noticing a parent, when you were little, you notice a parent shutting down your emotion, what are you going to do? Yes. Of course. Because you think that's the only way. Like, if I'm feeling angry, what does mum, mum and dad treat me when I'm angry? How do they treat me? 
usually don't want to punish me, right? So what am I, am I allowed to feel anger anymore? No. no. So I have to shut that down. So I learn very quickly that there's certain behaviour that I've got to now start shutting down with my mind, right? It's, and yet it, the opposite thing needs to actually occur. We need to be able to express those emotions so that we can get to the cause emotion and experience that and then release that. But a lot more of those questions will be answered today, I think, when we start talking about what the soul is. Okay. Yeah. Um, hey, Jay, I'm Do not choose our parents, our parents choose us. Yep. So, why, I mean, if we have parents who are abusive and, and some other parents are lovely and loving, what, how that do we get a chance that is like um, the inequality of it? Well, firstly, understand that God created equality. God, what God wanted was that each of us would incarnate into a pristine, into a pristine preparation of a body with no emotional damage. That's what God wanted. It was man's choice to become self-reliant that created all of these emotions of inequality. So every inequality and injustice you have ever experienced is totally the creation of someone before you some person who has walked away from God. So it might be, you know, your parents or it might be grandparents or might, and if we trace it right, right back, it's the first human couple decided to walk away from God too. So understand firstly that God wanted this pristine environment for you to incarnate into. And every feeling of injustice that you have within your soul now <coughs> is due to people deciding they didn't want God involved in that process anymore and and that's why God has a lot of uh, I suppose you could say um, love and mercy for each of us and no matter what we've chosen to do even for a murderer God has love and mercy and the reason why is because God knows that the creation of that person to become a murderer was caused by all of these different emotional conditions right that God doesn't didn't want man to create in the sense of when I say didn't want, he gave us free will, the choice to do that if we wanted. But from God's perspective, he would prefer to see us make some choices in harmony with love. Right? And every time we make choices out of harmony with love, we are going to experience the pain of those choices. And unfortunately, the way the system works, and, and when I say unfortunately, it's I believe actually that it's a beautiful system to bring us into correction, is that the more of us that feel the pain of what we've chosen as a human race, the more of us will feel like what we want to change. So how many of you are here, like, because you've had at some time in the past, experienced so much emotional pain that you want answers? Like, wouldn't pretty much, like, the majority of us feel that way, right? So if we hadn't have got that emotional pain of correct, which is what, and then had this desire for truth in our heart, we wouldn't come to a point of correction. And so God's automatic created this automatic correcting system in all the universe. The physical universe has it, the spirit universe has it, and our soul has it. This automatic correcting system. If we listen to it. And uh, that's where all of our pain comes from. So understand that where all of our pain comes from was not the creation of God. It was the creation of man who wants to be in disharmony with God and exercise his free will down the road of self-reliance. Yeah. And that's why in the first century I called that the wide path. The wide path and the Bible and the other scholars added the words that leads to destruction, right? But it's actually a wide path that most people follow because most people just go along with the norm and don't have these epiphanies that we need to have to realise that, hang on a sec, where we're going here is just creating more pain. <laughs> How many of you believe it's true? Like, I believed it's true at one point in my life, exactly what you've said. The reason why it's totally false is because we're discounting the law of attraction. Each of us, including like, what we create, uh, we are all creators, all of us. You all went to create this government you are now living under. You are all beginning, you have all conformed to its laws and rules. And you all feel powerless to change it. Many of us do, don't we? We feel powerless to actually change it. 
The truth is actually very, very different. The truth that we need to understand, and this is some, another thing that will come out today, is that the soul, the real you, has the power to change everything around you. All right? One person in a state of one with God has the power to change the world. Completely. One person. Right. That means you. <laughs> you have actually, in you, this ability, once you're at one with God, if that's what you desire, you have this ability to change the world, just you. And that means not just change, I'm not just talking about changing the world in some kind of, like, you know, mamby-pamby sort of, like, you know, gentle sense. I'm talking about confronting every single thing around you so much that the whole world begins to change because of you. You have far more power, but only when you recognise where it comes from. It comes from your soul, not from your mind. So what we often do is we see all these injustices in the world, we see these governments doing these things in the world, and we see this separation between the first tier of government, if you like, and the people and so forth. And we see all of these things going on, and what we then do is go down the track of trying to change it with a force of will. Right? Don't we? Like, we get into this state of getting angry about it. Anger is a great thing because it has a tendency to motivate you out of powerlessness. When in reality what we need to do is just feel our powerlessness. But we get into that state and off we go and we actually want to force change in the world. And in the end we can't. And so then what we do is get into this terrible hopeless state because we're doing all of this driving it from this top level that's not connecting with our soul. When you change your soul to the point where you're at one with God, every single thing around you will automatically change. Right? The law of attraction will happen that way. There will be, like, I've had it just happen just like on the trip down here yesterday. And I was driving along with Tristan and my son, and, and I just said to Tristan, oh, I think we should wash the car, because right? the car's a bit dirty out the bush. And... Uh, but I've got to pick up these CDs from somebody and I've got to go and also drop these plans off to somebody else and I've got to get all these things done in Gympie. Right? And uh, so I just let myself feel about that for a moment and then we rang up the man who had, had to do, I did, had to do the plans with and he said, oh, can I meet you at the car wash? <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, the CDs that you need, I've got with me. And then he arrived at the car wash and he said, I've got no idea why I wanted to meet you here. <laughs> he did, that's what he said. He said, I don't know why I didn't get to meet you out where you went past. Because <laughs> we went past him to meet at that place. And, and what I realised at that point was the law of attraction was just happening, that was like just based on just a desire from the soul automatically happening. That's the beauty of a lot of these things. Once you change the soul, your soul just has a desire and everything just happens around you. Like... Last, last night, uh, I said to Mary that I've, um, I wanted to have uh, some tomatoes and, and uh, mushrooms for breakfast. <laughs> and uh, and we, went, we went down to West End and we didn't get my tomatoes and mushrooms, but we popped out of here, down here and we walked across the road to have some lunch. And lo and behold, there were my tomatoes and mushrooms, <laughs> exactly as I ordered last night, actually. And so that happens all the time now. Like, all of the time now, I get exactly what I want, and, and, and it just comes from the desire of that. I don't have to think about it, it just sort of pops into my life. You follow me? Now, that will happen to you when you work on the soul. It's to do with the soul, it's not to do with the mind. You're saying, you know, like saying affirmations, it doesn't help your soul. How can you get there? I mean, <laughs> Let, let, me look at, let me look at one affirmation. You're jogging along. I am worthy. I am worthy. I am worthy, right? To receive all of this abundance, right? I, so we often say to ourselves, I am wealthy. I am wealthy. You're not wealthy. <laughs> right? The truth is you feel broke, right? right? That's the truth. So what do we need to go into emotionally? What we need to do is go into emotionally. I am broke, right? Now go deeper into that emotionally, right? How does it feel being broke? I feel like nobody cares for me, nobody looks after me, I've always got to drive it myself, I've always got to work hard. You know, and when you start connecting with some of those emotions, where do you go then? You want to cry about them, generally. So cry about them, 
release them because they are childhood emotions. When you do that, the emotion of I am broke has left you. When that leaves you, automatically, the law of attraction will bring you everything you need and you won't have to say any affirmations at all. Right? So when I was saying affirmations, there was a time in my life when I was doing that and nothing changed. As soon as I allowed myself to connect with the causal emotion, the underlying emotion, which is usually the opposite of the affirmation. Right? Did you notice that? The underlying emotion is always the opposite of the affirmation. Right? Right? So I'm saying, I'm, so I'm, I'm saying, you know, I am wealthy, I am wealthy. I'm, I'm really broke, right? And I'm just not being honest about it. And I'm not connecting, I'm not connecting with the underlying emotion. Of, of why, of what's the emotion inside of me that causes me. And you'll find there's some very core, childlike feelings in there. And one of the biggest core ones is, God does not care for me. Mm -hmm. Right? That's a huge core emotion that all of us uh, usually have to get to the point of releasing. I think maybe before you're saying, like, we um, use free will and everything, um, it's like, I think to myself, I didn't choose to have all this pain. So, where yeah. is the free will there? Let me clarify free will, the issue of free will. The issue of free will starts at the time you incarnate, you're not even really conscious of your own free will. And unfortunately, the people who are conscious of your free will abuse it. So, from that moment on, the majority of us are facing problems because our parents chose to abuse our free will from the moment we were conceived. All right? And at some point, some generation's got to change this cycle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? It's not really a choice, is it? Because they're sort of reacting. No, what I'm saying is that it was the choice of the parent to do that, right? Not the choice of the child. So when you're a child, you're a right, you are, because you're just a babe, even in the use of your free will, other people's free will gets imposed upon you. And that's the damage that's done it, to you. It's not, they, not really their free will if they're unconscious of what they're doing. Um, how many parents, like, as a parent, I've been a parent myself, and I know that a lot of times I was conscious of the denial of my own emotion. So certainly most parents are conscious that they are running away from their own emotion. It's just they don't think it has an effect on their children, but they don't see the linkages. And this is a problem with untruth, is we often don't see the complete linkages of what's actually going on. Now, getting back to the first part of your question, which was one of injustice, isn't that unjust, right, is the question. And the, the answer is, love isn't just. Are you saying God's love isn't just? I'm saying all love isn't just. Well, you better explain that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was confronting, hey? How many of you feel like love needs to be just? In fact, I'll just give you an example, right? Um, I was trying to work through issues. I, I was married at one stage and I was trying to work through issues of why I didn't feel uh, like I felt like God wanted me to stay in this relationship because of my religious beliefs. And I, uh, I couldn't understand why there was so much pain in this relationship. No, because I felt I loved the woman and, uh, and I didn't feel like she loved me. And I went along to a, uh, a psychiatrist and he said, you know what your problem is? He said, your relationship's not just. He said that if your relationship's just, then you'd be right. It's only relationships that are just that are stay together. Now, in your life, you've probably noticed that actually. Like, if you've got two people who are willing to cheat on each other, they'll probably stay together. <laughs> Won't they? And you've got two people who aren't willing to cheat on each other, then they'll probably stay together. But if you've got one person who's willing to cheat on its partner, and the other partner doesn't like it, are they going to stay together very much? Probably not, right? You've got one party that's willing to lie to the other. If they're both willing to lie to each other, they often stay together. But it's when one does the opposite to the other that the relationship... Whoever came in... <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> when you've got one who, who, who does it, you know, who's doing the opposite to the other, then obviously there's, there's this thing that automatically happens. And what I'm saying to you is that that is not love. In fact, you will get to a stage in your life, in the future, 
where you can love another person and they can totally abuse you and you can still love them and you won't have any emotions attached to that. Right. Now, remember that's what I said in first century, if someone slaps you on one cheek, turn the other cheek, right? And that's what I was talking about, this aspect where you become a person who's able to forgive anything that occurs. Right? That's what love does. And that's what God does, actually, too. Right? So a lot, of times, a lot of times people here on earth and in the spirit world expect justice and don't understand that the reason why they're expecting justice is because they've been hurt and they want the other person to hurt as much as they hurt. Right? Isn't a lot of times that what justice is to us? Yeah. And, and so is that love that I want somebody else to hurt as much as I hurt? It isn't love, is it? Right? So understand that there's, not, there's no justice as we see it in love. The truth is that if we look at justice from God's perspective, well, that's a different matter. Justice is always surrounding the laws of love. And you'll understand what justice really is when you start connecting to those laws of love that God has. And, but at the moment, our earthly concepts of justice are actually, in most cases, only a desire to punish. You're saying you know that you you can still love someone who harms you, but in terms of like I can understand that in terms of anybody. Well, I probably wouldn't want to have a relationship with somebody who treated me really badly. Like yeah, I didn't say you would want one. Right. I mean, so <laughs> saying that, that when you said that love isn't just, and we were, I think you were originally talking about relationships, like you were talking about your marriage. Yeah, I'm saying that if I expect the other person to do anything that mirrors my own treatment of them, I am not loving them. That's, now, that's a concept of justice. You treat me how I treat you, isn't it? Mm. Right? But if I'm expecting anything from the other person, I am now out of harmony with divine love. I'm in harmony with natural love, because that's what natural love would do. But I'm out of harmony with divine love. It's not what God does. And in terms of loving yourself, though, you wouldn't really want that for yourself. Well, the question becomes, like, and this is something I had to work through myself a lot, right? Is that I was always thinking, yeah, you know, justice, 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 and having lots of emotions about that, of course, because every time someone treats me unjustly, you know, I'd go through an emotion. And in the end, that's what I realised I needed to do, was if I'm feeling feelings of injustice, it's because I'm expecting something from them in my relationship with them. And as soon as I'm expecting from something from someone outside of myself, I'm now in a state where I'm not loving them. But I'm not saying you'd have to be with them. Like, of course the law of attraction would probably mean that you couldn't be with them. Even. And that's okay, but you wouldn't make that choice to avoid them. Do you, do you follow me? How many of you, like, you've had something happen in the past, you've got upset about it, and the way you've calmed down your emotion is to avoid it. How many of you have done that? Yeah? Lots of us, right? And then we tell ourselves, oh, I've dealt with that. <laughs> the truth is we haven't dealt with anything, right? What we've done is we've suppressed the core emotional thing that we needed to release. And when we do that, we're just, we're just way out of harmony with life. Right? So the key for us to understand with all of our interactions with others is if I desire, if I need something from you, and I don't get it, and I feel something like anger or something like that within me, or annoyance or frustration, any of those emotions, I am out of harmony with God's love. Was that even similar to, like, my son doesn't like people having <coughs> He just doesn't like it. You know, when you go and visit the rallies and the old man yep. who's 93 and yep. just give us a kiss. <laughs> How old's your son? Like, he's five. Okay, and he he's really. He stands his ground and says, no. Nah. <laughs> you know who you know whose emotion he's reflecting? Yours. <coughs> no, no, yeah. There's an emotion inside of yourself about how it how it impacts upon your feelings of controlling relationships. And if you oh, look I at, think it's, I actually think it's fine that he doesn't kiss anymore. I know you think it's fine. He doesn't kiss. <laughs> 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 <coughs> yeah. um, I have a whole discussion about children. 
One thing you need to understand about children is your children are a complete reflection of your own soul injury. They are actually reflecting something back at you. How do you feel when he doesn't kiss them? I feel uncomfortable because I know they want to kiss them. So what he's, what he's doing that for is to trigger your discomfort, go deeper into your discomfort and feel what it's about. Once you feel that discomfort completely and go into the emotion and release that emotion, he will no longer do that. It won't worry him. It won't worry him at all. Yeah. He, what he's doing is he's expressing boundaries that you don't feel you're allowed to express. I know as a child, I remember. I'm not saying as a child. I'm saying right now. Right now, he is expressing boundaries you right now are not honest about expressing. <laughs> of course. Because he is a perfect reflection of, of your true emotions. Your children are you going to be your best triggers. They will reflect the emotion you're unwilling to deal with. Every emotion you're unwilling to deal with, they will act out. Do you follow me? Your children will act out every emotion you don't let yourself feel. At the causal level, they will act it out. So if they're acting out something, like they're acting out a fight... There's a causal emotion in you that created that. This is why punishing children for their behaviour is very damaging. Because you're actually not taking responsibility for your own emotion. Alright? But there's a whole discussion on that and I don't want to answer any more questions on that because I want to get onto this whole thing. I do have a question about the children that I want to ask. Them. No worries. Um, I'm very lost today, Jane, about the reincarnation and how... Um, when I was watching your video and you said that no, you, you and people with you, the other souls were the first souls to reincarnate. I went, oh, no. <laughs> but so what was the emotion firstly that rose up? Yeah. Well, isn't it a feeling like, oh, I'm not special? Yeah. Yeah. He's saying he's special. Yeah. And, and to be honest, it's not that special. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my, question was, <laughs> my, my first reaction was, oh, hang on, you're old with me. That means I could have come out to reincarnated still. You know, so it was going into that whole, I was really special too. Exactly. But, so please understand when I'm saying that, I'm not saying that you're all not special. No. Right, that's very important to understand. <laughs> right, go on. Have other souls come back since you and... And the 14? Yeah. yeah, there have been others that have reincarnated uh, over the last five years or six years. So, or so. so that's the time frame? This yeah. Time frame. There are now, um, it was, it was, there was about six or seven years ago, there were, there were only four or five other souls left in this soul union state who could have reincarnated. One of them was my mother and father. And, they, um, and since then, there's, there's thousands and thousands of souls that have entered that state. So every soul that enters that soul union state, which is at the top of the 22nd sphere, can reincarnate, choose to reincarnate whenever they want. They have free will. <coughs> Some of them are not choosing to reincarnate because they had a complete, they feel they had a complete life on earth. Others who feel like they haven't had a complete life on earth are choosing to reincarnate. A lot of the memory-based stuff that occurs, that where we think we've had a past life, is all spirit, lots of spirit connection related. Honestly, Right now, none of you, none of you, have any idea how much you are influenced by spirits. Right? Right? And, and there'll be a time in your future, once you grow more and more, you'll, there'll, you, that you'll start realising how much influence there is. And when I say influence, I mean there's spirits around you just as much as there's people around you. And just like every person around you influences you in some way, so, do every, so does every spirit around you influence you in some way. I've got a, sort of two questions. Um, what is it when you like, meet people and you know them, or you recognise them, or you hear people saying stuff, like when I watched your DVD, I thought, oh man, I've heard all this before. Yeah. Like, so what is that? How many of you felt you've heard it all before? Yeah. Including the soul union yeah. stuff and everything. And even when I meet people, like, what is that? When you're, is it because you're looking at yourself and recognising a part of yourself? Or no. Like the spirit of the Every night you're asleep, right? Yeah. For about eight hours? Yeah. You don't stop doing anything. You just keep doing things. And every one of you have met me usually in, this, in the sleep state as well. In groups like <coughs> this as well, where you've learned things. 
And a lot of you, for a lot of you, this material resonates with you so strongly for two reasons. One is that you've already heard it before. And you've heard it in your sleep state. Right? The second one is that you have spirits with you who are influencing you to take notice of it. And that they're resonating with you. And you, sometimes some of you feel that resonance, don't you? Where you feel emotionally overwhelmed by something coming from outside of you. Where you feel that it's a confirmation of what you're hearing. Now, both of those things are to help... God created all of that to help you learn things. This spirit interaction happens throughout your existence. And in fact, you are a spirit when you're asleep. Yeah. So every one of you... And I don't know if you've ever tried this, but if you have a medium friend on the opposite side of the world, ask them to channel you while you're asleep. Because <coughs> you can do that. <coughs> Did you know that? Sure. Every one of you could channel via a medium, if, if you're asleep. So a, a medium can speak with you in your sleep state, if you're asleep. And you, you will tell yourself things that you don't know while you're awake. So you can film it and then watch it the next day. You could do anything you want. <laughs> there's, there's so many experiments that you can try, right? There's so many really, really practical experiments to prove the existence of a sleep state that you could try, and that's one of them. There are so many experiments that none of us usually try because we don't think of it, right? And we're not aware that this is what's going on. But every single night you are asleep. You are in a state where you are learning still and experiencing things still. And you can talk to people on Earth still. You know, I just this is an interesting question I ask some audiences. How many of you as a wife or have been married and you woke up one morning and knew that the partner had cheated on you. Yeah. Have any of you experienced that? Yeah. Right? yeah, a few of you? Yeah. Now, how did you know? The answer is, you saw him do it. You saw him do it. Or her. Now, see, this is... This is where the truth... See, we think we're covering over things all the time, right? But in reality, we're not covering over anything, right? Every, every, every experience that we have, we are able to... And somebody else is able to see, right? And I'm not saying to change what you're doing because of that, because in the end, it has to be coming from you, right? But understand that you... Like, this is why sometimes you wake up with a knowing. Because when you were asleep, you were observing something. Right? And you wake up with a knowing because of that observation. And so don't think that when you're asleep everything's turned off. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's turned off is your physical forms having a rest. Your soul, which is the real you, is still with this spirit form. And you are assimilating things from the spirit world in that state. Is Every that single why, time. Is that why you feel exhausted sometimes with that cast of thousands? Of yes, sometimes you wake up with a terrible feeling of exhaustion. A lot of times that kind of feeling is where you, you might have been helping people in a lower state and, you, you know, and they were in a bad state projecting emotion at you that was triggering you. A lot of times you might have been crying in your sleep state. How many of you have woken up crying? Oh, yes. well, the majority of us at some point, right? So why is that? Because there was something being triggered in our sleep state which we found to be a very grieving experience and we're just waking up in that state, in that connection. Understand that eventually you will remember all this. And there's a lovely book, um, it's on the, the, the CDs that I just passed out, Robert James Lees, um, called Through the Mists. Really worth reading if you haven't read it because, it, and I've said, said it before, but read it, you know, because he actually passed, and when he met his mother, which was right at the end of the book and into the second book, we called The Life of Elysian, he realised that he'd never left her. She died at his birth, and yet he, she, he knew his name and every sleep experience he had had with her. He remembered. Mm -hmm. right. And once we start understanding that this is a seamless existence, then we can start having a lot more confidence in what's going on and, our, and God loving us right, as well. Second part of the question. <laughs> I'm going to have to stop the questions. This is about One. the uh, cause and effect. Yeah. Because um, I've had many emotions, well, two main emotions during the week. Yeah. And um, and then I tried to put 
push something away that would have allowed me to have dealt with it, but it came in my face. Yeah. So in my truth, I spoke my truth, and then that emotion went. Yeah. But then it was a very similar emotion that came back, and so here I am thinking, oh, I've dealt with the cause. But, like, how do I know if I've dealt with an effect or the cause? Well, the law of attraction is telling you you haven't. Because it comes back. Yeah. As soon, and, um, as, soon as the law of attraction brings a similar event back in your life that triggers a similar emotion, you know that you haven't dealt with emotion. Mm -hmm. So, I see a lot. You actually, you bypass all the effects and go straight into the cause and deal with it and like just get rid of it. Well, it that, that, that is because you're worried about what the law of attraction is going to bring you next, right? <laughs> you're worried about getting slapped around a bit in this law of attraction process. But um, the truth is that um, every time you deal with a cause right to the end, then no longer will you attract the same thing. So, that's the first thing to remember. Secondly, how then do I go in and deal with causes rather than having to get triggered all the time? Well, you're going to have to be very honest with yourself. And to be honest with you, not many people are that honest with themselves. Right? And that's why we need the law of attraction to pull these things into line for us. That's why God created that law, in fact. To so the more I can be in my truth about... If you stay in truth emotionally, and this is one of the of things we talk about too, regardless of that, I'll get to the cause quicker. you'll get to the cause much quicker. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Truth is your pathway into your emotion. Do everyone understand that? Yeah. Truth yeah. is your pathway into your emotion. And I mean you being in total, complete truth. Right? And it's very challenging at times because no one around you wants it. And half the time, you don't either. <laughs> right? A lot of times we don't want to face... Like, how many of us sit down and say, actually, I feel very dissatisfied with the relationship I'm in? How many of us do that in a day? We will go weeks and sometimes months and sometimes, like I've gone years, in a very dissatisfying relationships, not looking at the causal emotion. Yeah. So truth is your pathway home, always. Yeah. The more prepared you're willing, to, the more prepared you are, and willing you are, and desirous you are, of being in truth, the faster your emotions will appear. You try setting your intention one day. We'll talk about intention a bit today. You try setting your intention. I'm going to just face all truth. I guarantee, if you set that intention from your soul, the next day you will start getting truths that you are just going, whoa, and it'll be about your life. It'll be very confronting things in your life. Now, one, one lady who was travelling with me, she wanted to know the truth about everything that was going on in her relationship. And bang, she got just hammered with all of these times her partner had cheated on her and all this. They all just came to her all of, over the next few days. Right? Because she set that intention. Up until then, for the 11 years, she didn't want to know. Why didn't she want to know? Because she didn't want to deal with the emotion that it would trigger in her. That's why we don't want to know. How many of you want to remain in ignorance? Not many of you, that's really good. Right? Because if you try to remain in ignorance, there are laws you're breaking that are harming your soul if you try to remain in ignorance. Was that intuitively or was she actually sat down by her partner and told her? Her partner told her things, other people in her life told her things <coughs> that her partner wasn't telling her. There was just things like emails that came to her by mistake. All sorts of things happened. But not by mistake. Not by mistake. She had set her intention fully at the soul level. And all of a sudden, she, she was in this space now where she was willing to face all the truth. That must have Oh, it's totally frank. But scary at the same time, because what is she going to have to do with all of this? Process it emotionally, right? Now, I've got to stop the questions, because I, I need to get started on our discussion today. Many of, many of the things in our discussion today will answer many of your questions. Because a lot of the questions that you are asking are all related to the human soul. What is my soul? How can I access the power of my own soul? That's the stuff that a lot of this is about, right? What is my soul capable of doing? Well, these are all kinds of questions that if we can understand the soul, then we understand what's really going on. Now, from a, from a you know, perspective of what the soul is, remember I've said that, um, that God created our soul. Remember our soul, of which you are one half. 
So you are not a complete soul. You are one half of the soul right now in this form. Right? So God completed the, created the complete soul. The complete soul is different to the discussion of the two halves. Do you understand? You at the moment, many of you believe yourself to be an individual. Yes? But you're not. You are one half of an individual. And sometime down the track, you will come to feel that emotionally. And you, at some point down the track, you will feel that so strongly emotionally that the two of you, whoever the other half is, will combine. And you will become that one soul again. Can we do that in this lifetime? Yes, totally. God created all of these things I'm talking about to be done now, not later. And we will and people are. And no one is right now, no. But there are people... One person? Sorry? How do you morph into one person? Is that what you're talking about? No, no, no. <laughs> see, see, this gets to what is the soul. What is this? What is this thing? Right. That is not a person. What we see as a person is a half of one of those. Right. There's a lot of confusion about this. <laughs> So are you saying that we can, we've got the possibility or the, the to come together in this lifetime with the other half of our soul? Yep. We're not talking soulmate, twin flame, we're talking the essence of ourselves. Is that what you're saying? Now, the word soulmate and the word twin flame are all just talking about exactly the same thing. And that is the fact that God... That's, that's the half of the soul. But only when you have the power to do so. And all of us are just growing in this power, right? So eventually you'll get to the stage in your own life where you'll no longer see yourself as this and rather you'll see yourself as this and, and as half of that all combined and you will actually, in your own life sometime in the future, be able to manifest an expression of yourself through lots of different entities, through lots of different what appear to be entities. And you'll be able to do that in the future. This is your soul's cap capacity for growth. Now, at the moment, you can't do that, right? But you will be able to do that. If you grow in divine love, you will be able to do those things. And then the, you're saying the complete soul can then manifest in that way? Yep. The complete soul, not the two halves. Yeah, yeah. The complete soul can manifest in this way that you can have multiple bodies. You can have, you can have th hundreds of thousands of emotional conversations at the same time. And feel every one of them. And you have to have met your soulmate firstly. Yeah. You have to have gone through this process of growth, yeah, which is growth in divine love. And we'll talk about what the soul's process is as a part of this discussion. But you have to go through that process to get to that capacity. But you can get to that. Every single one of you has been created with the potential of that capacity. It's just a matter of you coming to understand divine truth in the end. You follow me? Not your truth, but God's truth. It's only understanding that. So this soul is an entity in its own right of which you are one half. When I say you, I'm not talking about your body and I'm not talking about your spirit body. This body, this body that you have and the spirit body you have are appendages or attributes of your soul, of your half of the soul. Remember, I've said that the two bodies are connected to these two halves of the soul, right? So here's our spirit body, here's our physical body. Right? And there's a connection point between them. Right? And this is the soul. Right? This is the real you. This bit. We want to know what that bit is, right? We don't want to worry about these bits anymore. You know, you know how, how many of you worry about what you're going to eat today because it's got to be healthy and you've got to take the right vitamins? And all that. You don't want to have to worry about all that, surely. You want it just to happen all nice and seamlessly, don't you? Yeah. In the end? yeah. Well, when you connect with this bit of you, everything will happen all nice and seamlessly. It will just run perfectly, right? It's because we're not connecting to that bit that we're thinking we're these bits. And there are many spirits who are here today in this room who are thinking that they are their spirit body. They call that the soul. They actually think that that is their soul. But they don't understand that's not their soul either. Their soul they can't actually see. 
And what I'm, what, you know, all of these truths that God gives you, you will come to see your soul, not with these eyes, because these eyes are just the physical body's eyes, right? But you will see your soul through your expression of your soul, which is through your emotions and your passions and your desires and your longings and your intentions. That's how you'll see your soul. So it is within us. It's not something outside of us. Uh, it actually is encompasses you. Um, so you can think of it like this. It, I've drawn it like that, right? But the truth is, here is your physical body. Right? Here is your spirit body on top of it. Right? And your soul is actually surrounding those things. Right? That's how it is conceptually, if you can think of it conceptually. And the soul, this thing, this round thing, is the real you. And these bodies are just appendages, like your arm is an appendage of your body. This body is an appendage of your soul. It's like an etheric body. And yeah, well the etheric body is the spirit body. And the physical body is just a, an, of different energy form, denser energy. But they are all just a part of the emanation or the creation of your soul. When I say the creation of your soul, obviously it's another person's two souls that get together, the two halves get together, through the sex act create the two bodies, but the soul itself is God's creation. So this, this part of you is the real you, this bit. That's the real you. And as an extension of that, you need to understand that really that is the real you of which that is a half. You follow me? Yeah. We've been taught we're all one whole person. I know. <laughs> 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 I have to you say I'm my other half. I'm going, there's no way this is one. How many of you don't want there to be another half? Honest, be honest. <laughs> A lot of people don't want to be enough time. Sorry? There's also a hope that you that there is another heart. Well why in the why on the earth do you enter a relationship for? Because there's a soul longing inside of you to connect with another sex. There's a soul longing inside of you to connect with another heart. There is. It's in built inside of you. So do you have to feel that incompleteness and that longing fully before? The truth is, if you're feeling complete, then there's a there's an emotion in you that you're yet to release. So you can actually be complete as a half of a soul in terms of the feeling complete, and usually that is when you have the best relationship with your soul mate. If if they also are wanting to feel complete, as well. So it's not about complete, completing the other person. This is just how God designed you. The real you is that. And what you are right now is that, which is the half of the real you. That's just the truth. How you deal with that truth, it's up to you. <laughs> you can say, I don't want to know the other half of the real me. I want to stay away from him or her. I don't want, don't want some mongrel man being involved in my life. And what does that tell me? <laughs> <laughs> That I've got an emotion inside of myself, right? That I need to release. Do you think you're going to be at one with God having a thought like that? Obviously not, because it comes from a feeling of hurt inside, right? So many of us feel resistive to the idea of there being one half of us out there somewhere, and only one half, because we then feel like, well, where's my choice then? It's all gone. It's this that's been given the choice. It's this that's been given the choice. Remember I said the soul has free will. That is the soul, not you. You're a half of one. It's the two of you together that creates the full one that has the free will. That's another physical being. Has well, at the happen? moment for yourself, yeah. But it doesn't have to be a physical being. So for all the spirits in the room, there's, uh, there are actually many of them have passed hundreds of years ago and they would have another spirit who's actually their soulmate half. Yeah. Yeah. They do? Yeah. Mm. And yes, there is sex in the spirit world too. <laughs> there is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have sex in the spirit world in my dream, but... <coughs> is that fair dinkum? That they, spirits can... Yes, that's...
that's why I answered Maybe your question you before you asked it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, don't be smart <laughs> <laughs> I like being a smart ass sometimes. No, no, no. <laughs> 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 yeah. They, the they are, they do. The yeah. truth is that sex, the, the, the sexual expression is an expression of the soul. It's not an expression of the bodies. Mm -hmm. right? It is an expression of the soul. Right? So the soul has been created to have sexual relations. Right? That's what this whole soulmate thing is all about. It's about sex, really, in the end. <laughs> so the spirits to have sex, this is getting a bit involved, <coughs> is it through um, an, um, an energy experience mm -hmm. more than what you would call a physical experience? Yes, but to them, like energy and physical are the same thing. So energetically, I mean, if you want to create an orgasm or whatever, mm -hmm. um, you could do that on a... Do, do spirits... Is that how they work? Yeah. Like, I mean, I've had sex with a ghost, so to speak, yeah. you know? Yeah. And physically felt it. Yeah. Everything. It was just like it was a real experience. Yeah. Um, but it, it wasn't, because there was... Yeah. yeah. And it was a really... It was quite a bizarre experience to go through, and it actually brought up a bit of guilt, because I'm thinking... Oh my God! You know what kind of person am I? Mm -hmm. We're attracting what I thought was a bad spirit in order to have sex to have sex with me. Well, it may have been too, by the way. Well, there are many spirits in the spirit world who would like to have sex with people on earth still. So when you know when you're working with, with the spirits, I mean I'm a medium, okay? Mm -hmm. I've let that go because I just wasn't quite sure what I was attracting to myself. Mm -hmm. So in that case where I was attracting a sexual spirit partner, mm. does that mean that then, um, and maybe it was not of the purest of kind, does mm. that then s reflect on me and saying that was a state that I was in at that Remember, time? Remember, everything also. happens through the law of attraction, mm. right? So, <coughs> so what was the emotion that you felt after the experience? Wasn't it one of guilt? Oh, well, uh, oh, well the feather <laughs> trick was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> was just starting off on a, in a so-called spiritual journey yeah. where I was just starting to learn about things like this yeah. in this lifetime yeah. the, the I suppose the guilt I was feeling was coming from other people saying well you must be in a dark place to be bringing in a spirit and so basically then I went into the poor me said well what am I doing I must be a dark person attracting and so because I was very raw and very new and very gullible mm -hmm. and very trusting of what people were telling me, mm -hmm. I think probably I felt, well, you can, you'll can you probably say no, it's something that's been brought up in me, that's a, re, uh, a memory. <coughs> but for me at that time I thought, oh, oh I'm dealing with the dark spirits because I didn't know any different. And that's that's what I felt was. Well, do, you, do you mind if I tell you the you truth? You can tell me the whole thing? truth and nothing but the truth. I'm sure you're going to. <laughs> <laughs> so help me God. <laughs> I'm a divine spark of God. Give it to me. <laughs> the truth is that a spirit who would want to have sex with a person on earth without them knowing what's going on is not going to be in very good shape emotionally. Mm. So, so the emotional condition of the spirit in that state is not going to be that good. There are many spirits who desire to have sex with people on earth because they're not having sexual experiences in the spirit world, because they don't think they're able to, or they're in a state where there are the majority of the same sex with them because of the injuries, and so they, they can't interrelate with anyone of the opposite sex. So um, many spirits look for people on earth in, to have sexual <coughs> relationships with as a result of that. And if a person is open to that emotionally, then of course you can encourage that sexual relationship. What it triggered inside of you were not emotions relating to sex actually. They were relating to guilt and shame and other, other issues that were being triggered inside of you that you didn't allow yourself to experience at the time. <coughs> so at the time the feeling was like you were feeling great about the sexual <coughs> activity, but there was also some other feelings associated with it that you buried. And if you allow yourself to go back to that experience, you'll remember those other feelings. And they're the feelings that the law of attraction is triggering in you to, to release. The key is to understand that no spirit who's in a good condition will want to do something to you that you're not conscious of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You follow me? Mm -hmm. 
just like you wouldn't want to do something with someone else if they weren't conscious of what that's you were doing, right? Mm -hmm. That's what love would be, right? Yeah. Yeah. It'll be a first fear spirit who's, who's probably missed out on some sexual experiences and so, you know, they're wanting to act out some of those sexual experiences on earth. And, and now, I'm not judging them or yourself, right? Because, because the law of attraction brought you the experience to trigger the emotion that you at the time actually shut down. And the key is to go back to that event now and let yourself open up that emotion. You follow me? Because that's what the law of attraction is bringing. Now, in the end, this spirit might even be a, a soulmate who's passed and they feel really attracted to him. Like, it could be that. But in the end, they are still in a bad condition if they've done it without you knowing what's going on or without you being aware of what's going on. So it doesn't really matter who they are. What matters is that I deal with the emotion that I need to work through about that, right? And you'll find in your case it will be related to some childhood experiences. Right? That things that you don't want to face there. <coughs> but the reason why I answered your question about yes, there is sex in the spirit world is because in the end this union is a sexual union. <coughs> right? And like it look, be honest, isn't sex one of the best things you enjoy? Yeah. 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 Okay. So do you think that somehow that's all just going to disappear as soon as you pass? <coughs> Honestly. Why would you think that? It's because everyone's told you that sex isn't holy, and sex isn't spiritual, and sex isn't this, and sex isn't that, right? Sex is all lustful and dirty and all those kind of things, right? And because of that, you believe that, and so you believe that all these spiritual things can't, you know, it doesn't work that way. Sex is inbuilt inside of your soul. This whole union is a sexual union. Right. So where do the androgynous ones come from? The androgynous ones? There are no androgynous ones. No, that's <coughs> they actually feel they're androgynous because they do not want to cope with their own emotions that cause them to want to feel that way. So all of you at the moment, there are some of you here at the moment who don't want to have sex <laughs> in the sense that you don't you feel that the sexual expression is not something that you're attracted to and my my i need to say to you that if that's the case there are some very fundamental injuries emotional injuries inside of you now if you passed into the spirit world you would not want to have sexual experiences there either and you may eventually call yourself an androgynous one right but just because I call myself something, it doesn't mean from God's perspective that that's what I am. Right? God created all human souls in this form. And the split happens for all. All people who are incarnated go through that split. So every single one of you have a soulmate, and you've got no choice about it. <laughs> <laughs> you make babies in the spirit world? Uh, no. God creates if I'm longing to find my soulmates and have developed characteristics about myself, does that then mean that my soulmate heart will be longing to find their soulmate and have developed particular characteristics that will match? Or is it about the soul, the journey? Is it about well, there's no or. There's no or. It's probably an and for a start. Yes, it is about the journey, and it is about the fact that the soulmate halves finish up attracting themselves to each other. Right. So um, there's a lot of I would want to say about soulmates, but I want to do a whole discussion on soulmates. Is that all right? Yeah. Because because many people have lots of questions about soulmates, mm -hmm. and and there are so many things about soulmates that are misconceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them being that you meet each other and all of a sudden everything's fine, and uh, that's often a misconception. Um, but the, there are other ones as well, like misconceptions about what a soulmate really is, that you can have many soulmates and all these kind of things. And I, w I would like to answer all of them specifically as a separate discussion if I can. Is that be right? Today? <laughs> October. How much, how much do I have to give? <laughs> no, 
uh, not today. It will be another time. I know a lot of you are interested in the subject, but to be honest with you, until you're connecting completely emotionally, it is really pointless you being interested in that subject. And the reason why is because your soulmate is going to trigger you emotionally so much that if you meet them and you're not willing to deal with your emotions, you are going to want to run away from them. Right? And what's the point of you being introduced and then running away from each other? Right? You may as well get yourself firstly in a state of humility where you can actually feel all of your own emotions, right? And once you're in that state, then you're ready to meet this other person who's going to trigger you full on no matter what state they're in. Right? So let yourself go through that process, right? Let yourself uh, understand that. So when we talk about the soulmate issue, I really, you know, really want to do that because it's a, it's a very fascinating subject for me as well. And, and there's lots and lots of lot, lots of things I'd like to say about about soulmates and, and ways to you know work through these emotions with your soulmate and so forth. But it's important, firstly, that you understand your half. In fact, yeah. understand yeah. yourself, what mm -hmm. you actually are, mm -hmm. what part of you is your soul. Right? Mm -hmm. Get that moving along, progressing, growing spiritually. Right. Once all that happens you will automatically attract your soulmate into your life and when you do, you're going to wish that you hadn't, probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, because for many of you, it is going to open up some huge injuries inside about masculinity or femininity and you'll need to work through some very big emotions when you meet your soulmate. There's a part of your soul, you can, you can see that at the moment, this half of the soul is connected to this body and it's connected to this body, right? But it doesn't feel a strong connection to the other half of itself. There is a connection between the two halves all the time, by the way. But it doesn't feel that connection very strongly. Firstly, because of a lack of awareness, but also because of emotional injuries that exist in the two halves that make them oppose each other. You follow me? So it's like having two Norse of a magnet being shoved together. What happens? They just get pushed apart. When we have incompatible emotional injuries, that's what happens. We, we push apart relationship doing that. Compatible emotional injuries cause us to draw together, like a north and a south of the magnet, right? Incompatible emotional injuries cause us to separate. Now, why not firstly focus on getting yourself to the point where you no longer have any incompatible injuries with your soulmate? See, once you do that, no matter what your soulmate chooses to do, no matter how they choose to experience whatever's going on within themselves, you will be able to work through your own emotions. You've got the truth in you. You'll be able to work through your own emotions. And they will be drawn to you, and they won't even better help themselves. Right? Yeah, will you want to be with them? Of course. But would it be a need? Would it be a desire, or would it be a need? It'll be a desire, but not a need. Can you understand that? As soon as you have a need for your soulmate, how many feel you need your soulmate? If you need your soulmate, hardly any of you have been honest with that question. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the honesty going? How many of you need, feel like you need a soulmate? Like you need to know who your soulmate is? Or just someone? You need to know. Yeah, just someone. How many do you need? Still not being honest with them. But what happens is that. Sorry? I desire to know, but I don't need. Yeah. And at the moment, actually, the truth is that you don't want to know your soulmate is. And the, and the reason why for yourself is that there's some emotional injuries about men that, that are unhealed. And yes, so what's that? think you work through that. <coughs> yeah, and so when you think about, you think, just all of you ladies for a man at the moment, and I'm, I'm picking on ladies here because, because there will, well, the majority, you know, there's probably two thirds of the ladies, but, but also because one injury that's a multi generational injury for women is the issue of vulnerability. Yeah. Most of you will recognise that in yourself. Vulnerability towards the male, the male dominating you. Right? How many of you ladies feel like you're sick and tired of men dominating you? Absolutely. Right? It's quite a lot, right? Now, now, that emotion is an injury towards the masculine. It actually is also an injury towards God. Because God's 
also got masculine qualities. How many of you men feel that women dominate you? Some. How many of you men feel like you can dominate a woman? No one being honest there either. <laughs> so, so they are injuries, right, that we have towards the masculine and feminine. Every injury that we have towards the masculine and feminine causes a repulsion of our soulmate. You understand? Mm. It pushes our soulmate away. Right? And, and the only way that we're going to attract our soulmate is by working through those injuries. When we work through our injuries, our soulmate will be attracted to us. So if we're in a relationship right now, we're in a relationship to work through those injuries. You follow me? The law of attraction is working perfectly. You're in a relationship right now so that you can work through these injuries. And you might find out the relationship you have right now is with your soulmate. But you won't know until that part of your soul opens up. Right? Now, if I'm a woman and I have a deep anger towards men about men controlling and being vulnerable to men, do you think the soulmate part of my soul is going to open up while that emotion no, is within no. me? It's not, is it? If I'm a man and I feel like I can dominate a woman, do you think the soulmate part of my soul is going to open up? No. no. If I'm a man and, you think, and I think that a woman can dominate me, or I feel like I'm to blame for all the things that men have done that are bastards in the world, and I feel that in my soul, do you think that injury is going to allow me to open up towards my soulmate? No. So can you see how much of our injuries are related to these masculine and feminine things? And that causes a repulsion of the two halves. You follow me? So, we're this complete soul, and I'm half of that, and that split at incarnation. Now, I've been through in the introductory material what happens, what the condition of this soul is before incarnation, in that I say that it doesn't have any idea who it is. It doesn't have free will, because how can you have free will when you don't even know who you are? You don't know how you can exercise free will. All it knows is to incarnate. It has these instinctual attributes, just like a bird in a nest, right? That at some point in the future is going to fly. Right? And what happens is that when it incarnates, now from that moment, it's now got individualisation.